the what would have been considered the first class section of the colonist car this section of the car is still other than the painted roof panels is an entirely still original woodwork components are still all original um, all of the wall woodwork all of the bunks is still all original all of the wall um, paneling is original uh, even down to the um, the siding inside in this part of the car is still original as well we tried to maintain this part of the car as much as possible and no, keeping it this wall partition too is this wall partition is not oh no that's great this is the one we moved that here. one that one is that's the one that's built up with the, the many layers of of wood is the partition that's right here on this end um, the bathroom is original um, down to the porcelain tube that goes straight out onto the tracks there's no holding tank on a car like this. It was, it was just a tube with a sign that was set out when it was in station. Please do not use toilet while train is in station. Uh, the sink that's back behind you there, that's probably not an original piece. Love it. Um, I'm not sure if you can, if you can see. There's a copper water tank behind this, uh, this wood uh, cover on it that would have been the water supply for the sink. And it would have been filled from the very top. There's a, there's a spout that goes out the roof with a cap on it that when we were, and it still is because we didn't clean it out, is full of straw, the water tank from the birds nesting in it <laughs> or mice or squirrels or whatever was nesting in it. Bird's nests were really neat. There was two places in the car where as I was doing the demolition had bird's nests fall out of the ceiling onto my head <laughs> from them being able to get inside the car and nest and big nests too. Yeah, trying to, to a lot of it was like, it, like you said earlier, it was like forensic carpentry. Um, but a lot of it was trying to figure out why they did things in that way. Beginning, it was, it was really something that, that didn't come about automatically. But as I worked on it more and more and, and got more and more into it, it was like, oh, of course, that's exactly why this was done. Um, you know, for instance, one of the, the interesting details that wasn't in the car when we worked on it, but was in the photographs, were these little bolsters here that stick out. Um, really don't appear to have any purpose whatsoever. Um, in the car, when, when we started working on it, these had been sawn straight across the top and then just knocked off. So there's actually still pieces broken off inside the wall. From the photographs that we saw, these were incorporated. And then as I started building it, it became obvious why it was done because this piece isn't just doesn't just go straight up it actually comes out this is a piece of molding that's stuck on over top of the bolster so this goes right down to um, the riser beam and it supports this part of the car it goes all the way up and without this piece in there this is simply hanging off of the ceiling there's nothing actually supporting this part of the car so so it, it it may seem like an insignificant little piece of of wood sticking out of the wall but when it's all said and done it actually forms part of the structure of the car you need to un understand what it is that you're restoring and then go about making a plan basically of how we're gonna find the materials how we're gonna process it how we're gonna yeah and then get into your intervention phase and and the, the big one is having the information as a restoration carpenter is, is getting the information that you need to work through your process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, the, and this, we got the, it's like reverse engineered. We took this apart to figure out how, to, how it was built and then we built it. So it wasn't like we could start with, with something and go, okay, that's how that is made. This was peeling back the layers until you, until you figure out how it was made and what you're going to do next. And, and oftentimes that meant peeling it right back to the 
to the bare bones. And with that end of the car on this side, we had to replace all the studs and all the, the, the wall structure of it. But we had no idea until we actually pulled out one of the original posts that, oh, look, <laughs> it's tenoned into the beam. <laughs> you know, it's something that, that was completely not evident at that end of the car because we never pulled any of the other part of the car apart and to that level. Like we only pulled that end of the car apart because it was completely, it was falling, it was falling down. It was wrecked. Um, what would you do in a situation where you don't have the information or the evidence? I w didn't really run into that with this car. Um, the closest we came to, to just kind of fudging it would be these seats because we didn't have any original slatted seats to go from. We had these ones to go from, which is where we uh, determined that everything was dovetailed on the ends here. All right, so that's, this is how we determined how these seat frames were put together, was the fact that we had the originals still in the car. But all we had were some photographs of that end of the car that showed um, basically pattern of the slats. So up until we started working on this, this end of the car was still um, basically park benches for, work, for want of a better word. They weren't really actually proper seats at all. They were simply just plywood cutouts with slats screwed to them. Whereas when we discovered that from the from analyzing the photographs, it appeared that these had hinges and were split at one point. So these were actually exactly the same as the, the upholstered bed. Yeah. So these actually come out into beds as well um, but that was the this was the part where we didn't have the information we simply had just a photograph and from that photograph I was able to go okay well that's this looks like it's a bed there was no actual pictures of it pulled out but you could count the slats in the in the photograph and you can okay well the, that looks those look like hinges right there and it looks like it splits at this level so was was able to recreate it that way but for the for the rest of it it was really just make it up from what was what we took apart yeah, the, the documentary on the car was done by the national film board of canada and when they came through the car they literally just went for good from far. So a lot of the, the bunks had just been replaced with dimensional lumber and plywood and half the hardware was missing because well, it wasn't in the shop so it didn't matter. So where, like as Doug's described, where we didn't have information, we went to, the, especially Doug went to the pictures and counted slats. And if we hadn't had that, we would have been going from just a template of what we'd had when it was made by CBC, or sorry, the, the film board, right. and made it look like that. So the little details, the little nuance and stuff like that that we were able to save really was the whole point of the car. Like mm -hmm. the whole point of the project was to get it back as close to original as we could. So the bump that are down and the hardware that are in them that the hardware we had, we were fortunate that it was in the car when we got there. Um, we looked at having more than made so that all the bunks were functional and it was cost prohibitive and there was the concern that if we made them all available like that, it might start getting pushed into uses beyond storytelling and display. So we brought it back, we have the examples and everything is capable to be made capable to be made fully functional, but we don't have the spring spring bars in all of them. So we were able to find a machinist who was willing to make the attempt to disassemble one, to pattern and make us new parts off of it. But the springs in there are 
very, very tightly wound, so it was decided that the safest thing to do was to put a few in place and leave them there. Right. So Those are original. Yeah, These are all. They were in. The they car. were in the car. That was a. That was a. That po was an poke, day. poke a flashlight in a crack and go. Looks like there's a chain in there. <laughs> Take some screws out and then yank on it, and it actually operated. Yeah. It was just rattled down and, and supported it. Still in service. And these will, the ones that operate, you can lift this bunk with two fingers. Yeah, push it up, and these bunks probably weigh 90 pounds, the, the wood part of it. Yeah. Yeah. The balance is just excellent. So, yeah. What kind of, I guess just looking around, what, like starting at the top, what kind of trades do we have in here, starting with the lights? So with the lights, because they're, like we talked about before, replicated from images we've got, a 3D graphic designer working on them. They were 3D printed. The the master was then sent out and it was all cast, I believe, in rotary ceramic as opposed to sand cast. So that was because of the detail of the finish that we were looking for. If they had been sand cast, they would have had a rougher a rougher texture, more like a cast iron frying pan mm -hmm. as opposed to the smooth metal there. So I believe it was a ceramic cast. From the images and from sketches that we agreed on the diameter and the shape of the, the globes she actually had someone make her the hardwood glass blowing molds and then they blew the, the globes for us and then she had another associate of hers who's familiar with painting on glass to paint the the white shade above which is also all of those elements were inside the the photographs so it was we agreed on the shapes we agreed on the designs where again we didn't have accurate measurements, but it was all done by an artisan or someone who had the ability. The, the LED lighting system inside it is was chosen for LED because we were aiming for longevity. And the car originally had an acetylene driven light system. So there was actually a tank below the car that was filled with acetylene gas. And that's what lit the, lit the car normally. So we were trying to get something similar to a Coleman lamp or a a, uh, a silk mantle oil lamp. Right. And this was our first generation attempt. We're changing it out for something that's closer to now that that lighting technology has come up. There's there's an example where you don't you, you either can't recreate or you don't have the evidence of exactly what was there. So we'll put something that's different in, but discernible upon close inspection. Yeah. So yeah. We created the appearance of the acetylene lighting, but if I look closely, I think, well, hey, that's. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I always refer to it as the 2% rule. 2% of every, anyone who comes through here isn't going to be satisfied until they find something to be upset about or to be disappointed in. So that's my 2%. Yeah. Yeah, so. Discernible. We never want to create a false sense of history, but we want to make sure that our changes are discernible upon close inspection. People can see this wasn't actually part of the original, but it's yeah. really part of the interpretation. Yeah. So this would have been the, the main area for everybody traveling. Um, there's a few little oddities stuck on the side wall that we didn't do anything with because we really couldn't figure out what we could do with them. But the little clips that are here on the wall are actually to hold removable tables. Oh yeah. That that would have had a folding leg on it that would have been stored underneath a seat or somewhere. Um, closest I could find to a drawing that would illustrate that was from something from the 1880s of a table system that was uh, had a clip that went in like this and then a leg that went down. Uh, I talked to Sylvia about it and she said well you know let's just not do anything with them until we can actually figure out if we can find one or if we can find a picture or something because none of the photographs we had had that in it right. but it's that's what we've determined those were for, were for a clip for a table to sit on with legs on the bottom. And we need that evidence before we make it because we can't have conjecture. Everything else that's in here is as close to the original as we could possibly make it, right. given the, the, the resources that we had and without an actual image of that. You know, I just didn't want to proceed any further with it. So but one day. One day. One day, yeah. We may we may come across something that goes, oh, there's a columnist car table. Yeah. Time to make eighteen of them. Yeah. <laughs> so. So working out from there, on the ceiling, 
Is it wallpaper? Or is it? No, that's hand painted by our our gardener, actually, yeah. here at the Rachel. park. Rachel yeah. Rachel works for the painting department in the winter. The... So combined with the the photographs that we had and uh, the evidence we had on on panels that were probably not original, but could have been. You never know. Well, then we see in the photographs, you've got curtains hanging from the privacy rods and stuffed in corners and everything. So the visibility from the privacy curtain rods up wasn't as crisp in the photos because when people take photos, they want pictures of people. They want, you know, no one's no one's in the 1900s was going to take the time to take pictures of the the architecture and the fine details for us. So, so and then the majority of the cholesterol windows frames were in decent shape if i remember correctly yeah yeah the frames are original yeah the glass is mostly mostly, mostly original. original we had to replace a few of the panels but yeah, and the there's a couple different shades up there and the colors aren't all the same it's going on notes and historians comments and stuff like that that went that direction it is seems to be fairly clear that they weren't often clear glass in these cars and they were textured like that. I think they were textured so they didn't show the dirt. No. All the flooring were original to the car when we received it. And then coming down onto the privacy curtain rails, this is one of a few different styles of curtain railing that was in these cars. Um, the settlers coming forward would have had to buy their mattress, buy their pillow. If they wanted the curtains, they would have had to pay CP for them. And they kept them afterwards. They were their property after that. But base service was we'll give you a bunk but if you want anything you have to supply it and this was the style that was in the car when we received it and it was borne out by enough photos that we 3d scanned some of the existing pieces and then had them cast and braised together and turned them into what you see here our blinds are two original pattern from adams and westlake the rail fittings and furnishing supply company is still around they were able to, we found the closest match fabric we could that they supplied to, again, a black and white photograph. And then they actually were able to supply us with all of the, a full set of new blinds for the car. And that's that, where I fell into too, was determining why there was a slot in the windowsill. And all of these components ironically sit behind the slats above so if anything goes wrong with the blinds, you're taking the beds apart to get in and fix them. So from a serviceability standpoint as an artifact, it's not great, but it's the way they were designed and those were, that was the prototypical window at the time that we were able to find new to put in because we only had a half dozen or so that were even remotely functional. So. But everything we're seeing here in this car is designed to be serviced. Yep. There's a serviceability to almost everything that we're looking at. Yeah, it, it was some, some things would be a little bit more difficult to remove to service than others. But yeah, everything was put together um, with screws too. That's that's the thing. Anything that was put on that needed to be removed could just simply be unscrewed and, and taken away. Mm -hmm. All of the seats, same thing. Like none of these seats are, are attached. You could pick these up and just carry them right out of the car without any issues, you know? Yeah, nothing... Nothing was riveted, nothing was press fit. It was built to be, if something failed, it could be repaired. And that's, that was the design of the time. Like that was the mentality and design of the time. Like they're not gonna spend the time building something to throw it away because they've got the skill, they've got the ability and yeah, probably scarce to resources parts. as well. And things are harder to come by that. Yeah. To try and get lumber and steal and- Steal, to have one of these made. You can't just dial up Amazon and have it delivered tomorrow kind yeah. of thing, right? It's like, you know, one of these things breaks, it has to be recast. And and if it breaks when you're in Regina, well, the caster's in in Montreal. It's going to be weeks before you get it. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in Canadian Pacific's history, there's only one series of train car that they have ever, ever owned that does not directly drive revenue. If you lose this bump, you lose two seats, you lose two people spare yeah. because they have nowhere to be. So they wouldn't have ever designed anything with a long downtime. Side rail that car, get it fixed, get it back on the route. Because if it's not earning me money, it's a problem. So there was never, there was never the willingness to have something sit to be serviced. It was find a fix, get it going all the time. And still is today for the, the few people I know at CP that it's very much, everything can be serviced. The parts are where they need to be. 
yeah. all the time because if it's not rolling, it's not earning. And then down at this end, there's a kitchen. With the stove that we believe is the closest representative stove to what was in the car originally. Um, that's another <coughs> one of those mystery pieces where no clear image was available to us. It's the, the known history of the railway stoves that they would have had, you know, a pot retainer around the outside edge to guarantee that, you know, what you're cooking stayed where you needed it to be cooking. But this, this cooking area would have been shared between the 30 odd families. And going back to the photos and finding as much as we could and speaking with stove restorationists and everything else, this is, this was the unit that was in here when we received it. Uh, re the other interesting thing that we just kind of made up from, from kind of a knowledge base from Sylvia, from the railway historians, each one of these cars had its own heat. So it wasn't hooked into any steam line from the, the engine at all. Each car had its own heating system. There's pipes that run the entire length of the car. And those would have been steam pipes that would have been run from the baker run heater. From the baker heater. So there would have been a heater, something like this. <laughs> this one, we just kind of had our the, the blacksmith or the welder that had been working with this at the time just kind of put something that kind of looked like a heater together for us. Um, but it would have had a heater in this closet that would have been coal-fired. And the car wasn't attached to a train, say it was on a siding somewhere waiting, it could still be heated. It could still have heat inside it. So, you know, if for, for some reason they had to park it on a rail siding in the middle of winter and there's people in it, they could stay warm. So, but Little facsimile was made based on the Baker Heater setup that's in the door car. So one of our other cars has something similar to this in it that we used as a bit of a template to create a representation. Little piece of trivia is the brass plates set in the floor at each end of the car. Underneath that plate is a hole in the floor that goes through to the top of the bolster, which is the mounting point for the trucks. Okay. So underneath that plate is an inch and a quarter thick steel bar dropping vertically down through the metalwork of the car and into the center of the bowl on the truck. So the only physical connection or mechanical connection between the the bogies and trucks the bogies or trucks underneath and the car is that pin. So in the event of a derailment, the car would roll off of the trucks and likely the trucks would stay on the tracks or closer to the track. Yeah. It's still the way they build rails rail cars today. If the evidence of the derailment that we found was in that pin. Right, there's some shear on it or some deformation. Oh she was it was just it was bent. bent. Yeah. Like badly like to get it out we had, oh, we had this, I, forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think four, the, the one on that end came out quite easily. Yeah, this the one, one on this end, we oh. used a, a hundred ton hydraulic jack on the bottom of the pin to push up on the pin from the bottom, from on, on the tracks, we take, we which basically the lift the train car up slightly, like an inch, half an inch kind of thing. And then from the top, we'd hammer the top of the pin with a sledgehammer and it would break that little bit. So the car would bang down <laughs> and then we'd jack it back up again and then hit it at the top and bang. And as the pin came out, it started coming out straight and then it kind of twisted and turned as it came out because it was so bent. So by the, the last like third of the pin came out easily, but the first third, like four hours of, of jacking it up and then hammering on the top of it to get this thing to come up out of the car. I think, I think the first time we dropped it, it was an inch or a little more, and then being the guy on the ground running the jacket, kind of like, uh, 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 we're doing this in smaller bites. Cause <laughs> Cause it was going up and I was watching it go up and you're you're going, okay, well, we're just we're just relaxing the springs. Like the trucks are sprung, we're just relaxing the springs. It'll be okay. Then Doug gave it a smack from up here and I watched the car come back down and he was like, no, no, <laughs> small steps, please. It was just, and yeah. it's, it's one of those things that I'm, <laughs> had managed to, but now I'm never going to forget that because as the pin came out of the truck, it pushed the car up. Right? The pin was pushing the actual weight of the car up. The, car. But the trucks, it was 75,000 pounds, this car. And that was with all of the seats pulled out. Right. Everything was, it was gutted at the time. And it was just lifting 
like basically the shell of the car. And there's very little steel in it. It's a wood frame underneath. So that's all wood, like 75,000 pounds of wood. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's, a test, it's a testament to the craft and to the joinery and the, yeah. the yeah. versatility and the design that you can do, which we're now coming back to. There's, there's another situation where there are no notes, there are no descriptions of how they made sure that those truck pins were accessible. So I uh, path literally was, it fits the rest of the finish in the vehicle. It looks like it belongs. You know, slotted screws and countersunk heads and don't polish it because it's only going to get beat up yeah. so a little bit of the the Canadian Pacific mentality of make it as good as it needs to be not as not as perfect as you think it should be yeah. 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 and then this is another little piece of detective work that we relied on our uh, historians to help us with underneath about five six layers of paint was this little plaque right here and that's the exact location that it was in when we took it apart. But it's got stamped on the top 2502, which is the train car number. And then it's just got a bunch of letters and numbers stamped in it underneath it. That when we took it off, we gave it to Doug Phillips. And he immediately went, oh, those are the uh, refurbishing dates and what they did. Oh, yeah. So each, each letter and each number stands for a different thing that they did to the car. And then the last two numbers stand for the year, the month and the year. So we've got 322, 124, and 129 on it. In January of every year. Yeah. This, this car was brought in like every, you know, well, three times at least for refurbishing. That's, that sounds like something you guys still do as restoration carpenters. You're still doing that documentation. Yeah. And, and conserving the information for the next person who comes in that does work on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And there are still mysteries like the emergency brake cable hole in the wall went out to a valve that if you grabbed a hold of it, it sent an alarm to the locomotive. But we've got holes in the exterior walls, but none of our interior walls, our original interior walls or these ones, have that hole nor do we have the hardware for it. And some of the photos that actually shows it running continuously and then there was hardware that would actually trail down and keep the, the cord. Yeah, the there were like these little ornate yeah. brackets that dropped down from the ceiling that the wire ran through going all the way down. But, but with the ambiguity of not having holes in the exterior, we didn't put them back because we couldn't be certain how it went through the wall. Yeah. And hopefully someday yeah. we'll add those pieces. Yeah, and the information.